such photographs carry a highly emotional message to the internet audience. F uh, for this situation, it's fascist, we're coming again. This time with backing from the West, and there could there couldn't be that could be no questions to ask, asked, and no place for skepticism or opposition in this fight to the death. And uh, the message is also based on political ignorance. In many countries of former Eastern Bloc, uh, Eastern Bloc it is, there is a growing political ignorance of the population. In Russia, it was caused by a broad trade-off between the Kremlin and, uh, and the public uh, and the middle classes, mostly. In uh, it happened in 2000, 2000s. Putin brought prosperity, and the public remained passive and did not participate in politics. As a result, the most educated class lost interest in political news. But when you don't, when you don't read uh, newspapers, rumors in conspiracy series became popular, and they infiltrate all all space around you. And um, uh, the idea that. Uh, all politicians are corrupt, and politics is in general very dirty business, became very popular. And uh, not only in Russia, and also in Eastern Europe, and even in Ukraine. Uh, the, conflict in, the conflict in Ukraine from the beginning fulfills these leaks, intercepted phone calls and intercepted emails. And the, the general idea for posting these leaks on the internet was the same to confirm the prejudice that all politicians are corrupt, including those who are opposed Yanukovych, uh, and they are all agents of the West. And this, all this gets us back to previous slide, the appeal to the feeling of grievance against the West. And now uh, we have almost perfect scheme for propaganda. And the last question is how many trolls Russia has now? Uh, uh, we know for sure at least for one trolls, trolls farm uh, near the St. Petersburg in Olgina, uh, but uh, there, are, uh, uh, there was a report about, uh, about some similar places that located in other Russian regions, but it was mm, based on technical analysis and it was not it was not checked by personally by journalists or, or, or activists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's fascinating and, and quite daunting. Um, Eric, would you uh, like to share with us how, how other countries act in this space? And uh, whether this is only the tip of the iceberg or, or the norm already? Thank you, Marija, and thank you for the invitation to speak here. Um, I suppose my role here is in part to set out um, some of the work that we did with Andre uh, and others uh, as we concluded and conducted an investigation into surveillance equipment that was being used in Russia, but also in part, as Andre mentioned, um, surveillance equipment used in Central Asia more broadly. Um, as an NGO based in London, we, of course, monitor not just um, work that's taking place there, but also in Europe, at home, um, in the United States. And so I hope to, to hold a bit of a mirror up to look at some of um, the policies that we have in Europe and how, in many ways, we might be contributing to this effect of increased militarization of the Internet and control of the Internet uh, that can lead to very damaging um, issues for human rights and, and for democracy. So as uh, Andre highlighted, the system of SORM that was created in Russia has indeed spread. Um, there's essentially three models in the world that get followed. One is a US model called Kalia that in essence has stayed within the United States. There are not many other states around the world that have adopted that model. The second uh, is uh, Etsy standards, and these were created here uh, in Europe. And then finally, uh, SORM. Uh, and it's this contrast between SORM and Etsy and the positives and negatives and understanding what the difference between them is that I really want to highlight to us so that we have a clear understanding of, of what it is that we're concerned about and why. So as Andre correctly highlighted, 
One of the crucial differences between SORM and Etsy systems is the ability for the warrant to be shown to the telecoms provider. This means that when uh, the interception is sought, the telecoms provider knows in part what's being undertaken and can challenge it where acceptable. In the SORM system, there's no such thing in place. Across Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, we found SORM systems proliferating. Uh, many of these are growing um, with basic systems almost 10 years old now at a bare minimum intercepting 85,000 communications at any one time. Now these are very affordable systems, tens of thousands of pounds, nothing more complicated. Uh, and they're being resold essentially as second-hand Russian systems, uh, things that no longer uh, are of any value um, but that uh, an enterprising company has been able to acquire and provide at a discount rate to other states that may wish to put them into use. Across Uzbekistan and um, Kazakhstan, we're seeing um, something called a, a PU. These are central monitoring systems deployed into the core network infrastructure. What takes place here is essentially allows the security services of those countries to request whatever information they'd like at will. Again, these systems are not as comprehensive as we have here in Europe, um, but they're formidable. And when turned against political opposition, human rights defenders, pro-democracy activists, they're more than capable of achieving the aims of whatever it is that that state is wishing to do and to acquire. Indeed, in the course of our investigation, we found that many states there were uh, using surveillance technology to target human rights activists at home, pro-democracy activists at home as well. It isn't just Russian companies that are equipping the Central Asian states with this kind of surveillance equipment. Um, there's two other large markets that are promoting uh, and selling surveillance equipment around the world. One is the European market, and the other is the Israeli market. And in both circumstances, we found both European and Israeli companies actively promoting and selling equipment to the region. Trovacor, a uh, German company, um, had promoted monitoring centers to Uzbekistan, and so too did Utamako, another German company, uh, to the region. Most concerningly was the Israeli uh, companies Verant and Nice. In the last uh, five years, these companies have really sought to outdo the Russian contractors uh, and provide them with capability that any security agency, even in Europe, would be envious of. Indeed, the systems that they were offering to sell and indeed did sell, to the best of our knowledge, included mass monitoring systems capable of capturing, selecting, and storing millions of communications in the course of a day. These monitoring centers have been built in key locations, and telecommunications companies in the countries have been forced to provide direct access uh, and single lines to these monitoring centers. At this point, the telecommunications companies are left in a position where either essentially they provide the access that the security services request, cutting them out of the loop of what's subsequently done to their customers' communications, or fight back and I'd imagine uh, withdraw. Uh, many of these telecommunications companies are of course based here in Europe. It would seem to me that we could do more here to support them in pushing back against these kinds of policies, which mean that the state has unfettered direct access to the communications of anybody inside those countries. Remarkably, one of the systems that were also uh, offered to be provided included something called SSL interception, or SSL man in the middle. Some people will be familiar that when you go to your banking website, or even now your common email providers, there'll be a little green lock in the top left-hand corner. This allows you to communicate securely um, with that company and allows and promotes e-commerce um, and the privacy of communications right the way through. These systems are now in place by a large number of companies and they're considered best practice um, both to protect the security um, of those individuals but to prevent other actors, including criminals, from being able to intercept those communications. In this instance, the Israeli company offered to provide an SSL man-in-the-middle solution, creating fake certificates that would allow the state to be able to intercept 
these supposedly secure communications. We don't know whether such a system was eventually sold, but the offering of it and the fact that that system is exploitable is something that we should all bear in mind. Similar systems being sold on the open market suggest that it's a capability and technique that others are also using in a far more uh, common practice than we might have thought. To highlight uh, the, the difference between SORM and Etsy, if I may, and I apologize because I know that this is complicated and technical. Uh, as Andre correctly highlighted, this big difference is between whether or not essentially the telecommunications company is made aware of the interception that's taking place. Under one model, under the SORM model, they're, provided, they're expected to provide a room and put the equipment in the network and walk away. And under the Etsy model, there's a little bit more toing and froing. Now, this is an important safeguard, although our reports uh, and our investigation into how this is done in practice uh, has left us to be somewhat dismayed. I won't speak for m all European countries, but I'll explain the situation as it's ended up in the United Kingdom. Here, the Etsy model continues to be followed. Telecommunications companies are indeed um, asked to provide intercept capability, and they do when they're notified of that requirement. They are on occasion provided with the warrants, uh, but it's only for a very limited subset. Of the requests for smaller kinds of communications where warrants are provided to those companies, the system automatically executes them and provides them to the requesting law enforcement or intelligence body. This is because while in principle the, uh, the telecommunications company gets to see the request, they have no opportunity to challenge it. And so while the technical model distinguishes between SORM and Etsy, in practice many laws end up in a situation where the model is identical, where law enforcement or intelligence and security services request it, and even if there's concern by the part of the telecommunications company, there's no avenue or uh, model that allows them to um, push back against that. I think this is something that we should give some more thought to, to ensure that that important middleman, to ensure that there isn't overreach, main is maintained in the future. Of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight uh, the next stage of what Andre and Irina was talking about, the new frontier for Russia, in this instance, deep packet inspection, and the ability of that capability to acquire communications in bulk and for them to be analyzed on the internet. This is something that the security services of both United States, Britain, other Five Eyes members, which includes uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, have been experimenting with for quite some time. One of the highest profile examples of this is the British um, program codenamed Tempora. This program taps fiber optic undersea cables. These are the ones that enter a country, uh, connect the world, and carry 95% of our world's communications. Uh, it's here that Tempora works. And they managed to capture in 2009 40 billion pieces of internet data in one day. 40 billion. It's at this point that I must admit my maths begins to uh, fail me as I struggle to calculate and understand and quantify just how large that, uh, that information is and just how intrusive it is. Uh, with those 40 billion pieces of information that are captured, um, metadata, this is the communications about the, commu this is the information about the communication, the fact I sent a communication, to whom, where they were, for how long that communication took part. That is stored uniformly for 30 days. The content of all of those messages is not discarded, but it's, it costs more money to store. And as a result, all of the communications content, what you say in that email, what you say in that telephone call, are kept for three days. The main limitation on this capability at the moment is not law, is not policy, but it's how much money the security agencies of the United Kingdom have. It's these policies that are being replicated right the way around the world. The United States has a similar program codenamed Upstream. I won't go into the details here, but you're able to freely find out about that in the internet. It's essential at this point to talk about what it is that we can do here in Europe 
to look at these issues and to improve the situation. There's two areas where I think a lot more work can be done. We have a remarkable opportunity at the moment where a surprising number of member states are redrafting the laws that govern the intelligence and security and surveillance policies of their agencies and law enforcement bodies. The United Kingdom, Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, Finland, and also Switzerland are, are planning to update their laws in some circumstances in the coming weeks, but in uh, others over the course of the next year. There's a real opportunity here to put in place very strong protections, very strong standards, set out clearly what we think is acceptable, because these are the policies that one way or the other do get copied and exported right the way around the world. In Britain, there's going to be two key issues that will affect everyone in Europe as well. One is the proportionality of bulk collection, of mass surveillance. Is it right that states can intercept, retain, and store 40 billion pieces of information every day? Is that necessary? Is that proportionate? You might imagine, from in, coming from an NGO, Privacy International, you can guess where I come down on that. Uh, but it's essential that we have that debate. There are a number of court cases going up to the European Court of Human Rights that will be looking to challenge that issue, and I hope that some of their guidance will allow people to set in place clear policy. The second key thing that we can do in Europe is put in place strong export controls on surveillance technology. Much has been done on this in the work by Monica Skaka, among others, to be able to promote better controls, not just to ensure that companies who are wishing to profit from surveillance uh, around the world are restricted in doing so, but also looking at other policy solutions that we can use that aren't just around export controls. Uh, I think these are two clear issues that many of us in this room can look at, uh, and with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's, it's really getting more omnipresent, these, these systems, and uh, 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 I think we need to have another seminar about what the EU should do to be able to lead by example um, in terms of both uh, the technical aspects and the political aspects. But um, to zoom in a little bit on uh, European programs and, and thinking that's evolving around how to deal with mostly the information wars or the messages, I would now like to turn to uh, Mr. Pomianowski to explain what his findings are at the European Endowment for Democracy and what advice he might have to us here in the Parliament and the various people in the room. Thank you very much, Mariette. And thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here today with you. And first of all, I would like to congratulate Irina and Andre for this uh, excellent, uh, excellent piece of work that is uh, so much needed to, to complement uh, the picture that we already know but we still are uh, learning. The good news, uh, as my first comment, is that uh, Irina and Andre could still work on this uh, from Moscow. So still there is a hope in this world that uh, things are moving even there to the good direction. The bad news is that the freedom of internet is, is really under structural threat. And, uh, and the majority of uh, independent solution that the uh, European Endowment for Democracy was analyzing, advising on, are really um, mm, based uh, on, uh, on internet and on freedom of operation through this platform. So uh, uh, it is extremely important uh, for the future of, uh, of media, of independent media in Russia, in the whole region, to make sure that the internet remains a space uh, that is free. I see here in the discussion, especially listening to the Eric uh, uh, comment, that we really have to make a clear distinction between two dimensions, all the extremely connected. The freedom of media and the freedom or rather privacy of communication, they are connected issues, but really distinct from technological point of view and also regulatory point of view. So, uh, definitely the piece of work that endowment is involved and endowment is doing is, is related to the freedom of media specifically. Um, we've been tasked uh, six months ago to prepare a special report that is titled uh, Feasibility Study on Russian Language Media Initiatives where we focus specifically on Russian language media space. 
Uh, and uh, this was uh, requested by the government of Netherlands and, uh, and the report we produce was submitted in June um, uh, this year to the governments of uh, uh, member states of the European Union, but also to like-minded countries like the US, Canada and a few others. So uh, th th this report specifically focuses on the issue that arose over the last uh, 10 to 15 years uh, that was so well addressed by many experts, uh, um, 2008, 2010, among them, for example, Masha Lipman from Carnegie Moscow, who is explaining how this uh, media space is step by step monopolized by uh, several uh, TV stations uh, that are um, run and, uh, and directed uh, from Kremlin. So this was a long process, and that is exactly the part of the whole story that um, we here in Europe, we are not uh, um, capable to understand and read what experts are telling us. And in this context, having a red web book in front of us, I think it's a very timely uh, piece of knowledge that um, Irina and Andre are sharing with us. So we have, to, we have to read it and we have to make our politicians also to read it and to make some conclusions and to try to react to it. Because when the info war as a part of the uh, hybrid warfare in Ukraine erupted, everybody in Europe, especially among political class, pretend to be surprised. How come that Russian language speakers in Ukraine, Russian language speakers in Moldova, of course in Russia itself, but also in Baltic countries are so affected and so successfully uh, damaged uh, by the Russian uh, propaganda. They are watching Russian channels, the answer was, but why they are watching Russian channels? The, why there is no alternative? That why they have no a freedom of choice? Because this process took Putin 12 to 15 years, step by step, to eliminate from this space any kind of larger free media. And those who are in Russia still remain free, like Nova Gazeta, Echo Moskvi, uh, TV Dosh, they are under constant suppression. Many of internet web-based uh, um, activities are, with the technologies that were already mentioned here and they are mentioned in the book, suppress or deny access to Russian audiences. So here uh, we are having a very complex picture to which if we want to really react and, uh, and confront, we should have started much earlier. But old saying says, better late than never. So this is what is happening now. And here uh, the endowments report came with uh, some proposal what can be done, especially in the field of bringing back objective quality journalism to Russian language media space and bringing back plurality and freedom of choice in this space. So we are talking not about countering propaganda. In our report, we are talking about bringing fundamental freedoms to the one language media space that was so effectively captured by the single center of information and single certain of direction. What can be done? First of all, uh, what we discover, it's not about access to information, it's about trust. So it's not only truth that would prevail. It requires uh, really an effort that will uh, bring those audiences back to just uh, wanting uh, or having wanted uh, uh, addressing uh, using different source of media. That includes also entertainment, that includes a non-news content. So we have to uh, uh, find a way to build trust. And the only way we can do this is to strengthen independent media in the region. So the conclusion is extremely simple. In this a very difficult environment, let's focus on those who are still trying to manage in this space and let's help them. Let's allocate amount of funds that will be significant enough to give them strength and the budgets that they are today suffering from uh, being denied. That is the first thing. Second, uh, we have to address the issue from the uh, uh, point of view of the gaps that, uh, mm, uh, that uh, state-controlled channels are still uh, having. They are effective because it's a long process, but they are not perfect. 
there are uh, uh, significant uh, weaknesses. And this is one of the significant weaknesses we identify in this process analyzing the structure of the of the new of the media content controlled by Kremlin is they spend a very little time on the real life stories of the people and on the local or locally rooted uh, news stories information so the people can really see how their life looks like on the screen and out of the window. They can compare. It's very difficult to lie about things that are next to you. It's very easy to lie to the people in Moscow, Irkutsk, or Novosibirsk, what is happening in Ukraine, but it's very difficult to lie to them what is happening out of their window. So here is a very important avenue, how to rebuild trust. But that again requires a lot of investment, and definitely this is one of the solutions where the freedom of internet with the small media outlets growing and not doing a political messaging, but really trying to take care of people of everyday life can uh, grow up. So, uh, for me, the key point uh, uh, I'm taking from the Red Web book is that we are watching the certain process. The use of internet to uh, pursue also propaganda goals of the Kremlin-controlled uh, um, agenda, but at the same time, uh, enormously uh, um, growing technical and technological apparatus to uh, mm, uh, suppress any other form of uh, presence. And this is definitely a very, a very mm, uh, dramatic uh, trend where we have to find a way um, uh, to fight, uh, to find and fight, find a way and to find it back in order to really guarantee the freedom of, uh, of uh, mm, uh, media and apparently also a communication. Uh, if I have any complaint about the book, uh, is that uh, this is not yet and uh, not in a foreseeable future to be published in Russian. Because I believe that the Russian audiences uh, deserve to read this book uh, in Russian. So uh, my great uh, plea to the, uh, to the authors is uh, to as soon as possible make it available also in Russian and the endowment will be happy to support uh, uh, this dissemination of its parts or a resume or the book itself throughout our our friends and our uh, grantees, our supported partners in the whole uh, region. And I am saying it because those Russian readers are not only in Russia; they are Russian-speaking Ukrainians, they are Russian-speaking Belarusians, they are Russian-speaking Moldovians, Latvians, and Estonians. So there are many people that uh, speaks Russians that are not necessarily ethnically Russian. And that leads to the final statement that I would like to share with you, that in this context, in the context of our, our report, we strongly believe that Russian language does not belong to Putin, does not even belong to Russia, it belongs to everybody who wants to communicate in it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very important points about trust, which then maybe we can later discuss uh, how trust and credibility are built, you know, also from the EU side. I think that there is a key there that connects the media freedom questions and uh, the, the privacy or, or technological layers of this discussion together, really, uh, in a number of ways. Uh, John, could I give you the floor for your uh, thoughts, and then uh, we're going to start the discussion. Thank you, Marietta, yes. Uh, thanks for inviting me, or more exactly, thanks for inviting my boss, uh, Giles Portman, who heads the uh, East Stratcom Task Force at the External Action Service. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I bring his regrets, uh, Giles was not able to come, but instead of the boss, you got the expert today. Uh, <laughs> I'm one of a series of experts, uh, a total of 11 people working now for three weeks only, uh, having worked for three weeks with uh, a mandate that was given to the establishment of a East Stratcom Task Force by the Council in March this year. Uh, what we do, or more specifically, our action plan has been made available at the entrance here. It says action plan on strategic communication, um, which uh, is a document that will hopefully also answer the questions, many of those questions that uh, eventually will pop up today uh, among those of you who are interested uh, in the details of what we are doing uh, and of course basically what we are about to do because I said, as I said, we are a new place. Uh, we, uh, there is no history there's no track to return to and see 
what did colleagues do five years ago in a similar situation. Um, that you could call a weakness, it's also a strength because we are freshly uh, uh, arriving from different member states. We have people in, uh, at the team from the Czech Republic, from Estonia, Latvia. I'm from Denmark, uh, a seconded expert from Denmark, also a seconded expert from uh, United Kingdom, uh, and colleagues from uh, Germany uh, and uh, other countries. So. Um, our mandate, as I said, takes us back to the Council decision in March to specifically open us. As far as I've know, I know, not being an EU expert, I come from a position as a university professor of Russian uh, language and Russian culture originally. Uh, I've heard that that is a fairly uh, extraordinary thing that the Council sort of micromanages uh, s establishment of this task force. That, of course, gives us, and the, or me at least, the impression that uh, we're dealing with something which is a concern for and was. Um, major concern for the council. Now, the name of our group is East Stratcom Task Force. And what does that mean? Task Force, of course, means that we're dealing with a specific task. Uh, the task is uh, what both the, uh, the authors of the book and the uh, previous speakers today have been talking about, namely uh, Russian language media, uh, supporting them, uh, and on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, creating awareness around uh, on the one hand, what um, uh, the EU uh, does and is in Russian in a way where we sort of take the serve. If Russian language media uh, space is a tennis court, then we have the feeling that the Kremlin have, had had the serve for around 15 years. We want to take that serve over now uh, and give some positive narratives about uh, what the EU is specifically uh, in the Eastern neighborhood, uh, the partnership countries of Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova, um, which ties uh, our narrative closely to what Jerzy uh, talked about, uh, the issue of Russian language and the fact that you don't have to be Kremlin loyal just because you understand Russian and use it in your everyday. Even in the Russian language, those of you who know it, will know that there's a distinction between Rasiski and Ruski. Rasiski, the adjective uh, denoting that, so it has to do with Russia, the country, the state, and Ruski, uh, meaning simply your knowledge of the na language, of the culture, and the traditions, etc. I am a Danish uh, national, uh, but I'm an avid user and have been almost my whole life of Russian media. I speak fluent Russian. Uh, it means I'm a part of it too, although I'm not uh, a Russian citizen. We also say that our task force is perhaps the only uh, working place in the EU system, at least here in Brussels, where Russian is one of the language, uh, one of the working languages. Uh, a very pleasant thing for many of us. Let's go down to Ukraine and remember what happened uh, in uh, uh, important uh, aspect of what happened in Ukraine was, of course, the narrative that if you uh, the e if Ukraine joins the association agreement with the EU, then people will lose the right to speak Russian and they will lose the right, so to speak, to be. Uh, practitioners of Russian uh, culture. That was a very strong narrative down in Ukraine, part of what we are doing by uh, letting the EU speak Russian. Part of it uh, is to give, so to speak, the EU a Russian voice, uh, adding to the voices already available in our delegations in, in Kiev and in, in, in Moscow and Kishinev and elsewhere where uh, we are represented. Um, our big, uh, we, as I said, we're a new place, we work for three weeks, uh, our big uh, event is here on Thursday where we present our action plan uh, or the business plan, the more uh, focused part uh, to the member states at a meeting here in Brussels. Our main three objectives are described in the uh, action plan uh, and, 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 and I just want to uh, mention them again in order for you to be clear of what we're doing and what we're not doing. Uh, one objective we have is, and I quote, to ensure effective communication and promotion of EU policies towards the Eastern neighborhood. Now, the uh, key word here is the Eastern neighborhood. Why Russia, as a country, the Russian Federation, is a, a place of our interest, our primary interest at the end of the day, is the, uh, the, uh, the Eastern neighborhood, uh, which happens to be uh, using Russian every day. Uh, so in other words, when I come to my job in the morning, uh, and have to decide if I'm reporting on, as I do every day, on debates in Russian media and social media. If there is a debate I think is re uh, that has to do with Ukraine that is relevant uh, to my hierarchy, then I choose that over the Russian uh, thing. 
that being said, of course, acknowledging, as Jerzy and others have been underlining, that uh, the Kremlin-controlled media uh, define much of the agenda of what uh, happens in Russian language media, even in uh, Ukraine and Moldova, then, of course, I also pay a lot of attention to that. So uh, we promote and communicate policies. Basically, we try to create a positive narrative in Russian, make it available to delegations and to our stakeholders, member states, uh, and uh, our networks uh, of uh, journalists, media professionals, opinion shapers in the broadest possible sense uh, who use Russian in their everyday life and work life. We also, and I quote, uh, improve EU capacity to forecast, address, and respond to disinformation activities by external actors. So it's the first, the positive narrative was kind of a strategic aim. We have a more tactical aim in forecasting and addressing and responding to disinformation activities by external actors. Um, forecast is, of course, the crystal ball dream that everyone has, that there's someone there who can look into the future. Uh, no one can look into the future, but what we can do is that we can see trends, we can see discussions at an early stage, uh, and then uh, inform our hierarchy about it so that they can be prepared to respond. We are not a spokesperson's office. We work with them closely but it also means that we are in strategic communication, not in tactical communication. So we are primarily looking out for the strategic uh, promotion of a narrative and to a lesser degree, but also looking at uh, propaganda. Of course, we analyze propaganda. I'm in the part, I personally work in the part of the uh, task force that works directly with propaganda, with trolls. I hope I'll have time to return to the troll issue in a minute or two. Um, but uh, the third point, which is a point I know is of a major concern to many um, uh, of our stakeholders, the member states, uh, primarily is the strengthening, I quote, of the overall media environment in the Eastern neighborhood and in EU member states. Um, this is where uh, the European Endowment for Democracy also comes into the picture as an important partner for us. Uh, we, don't, we are not a donor. Uh, we don't have uh, an amount of money that we can hand out to people we think are the right people. What we can do is that we can coordinate uh, the, uh, the, uh, the work that is done in the Eastern neighborhood in order to avoid overlap, uh, in order to avoid a situation where uh, people attend, media professionals attend the same course in, say, critical coverage of government work uh, five times during the same year just because five different member states got the same great idea. Uh, so we try to coordinate, uh, which means that we both gather information and uh, proliferate information uh, about that to a network of NGOs, uh, individuals, and stakeholders who are interested in that. Um, now, let's look at the time. Five more minutes, yeah? Okay. Um, so as I said, we have, we work in the, uh, in our uh, East Stratcom task force with a number of uh, networks. Uh, some of them, uh, of the people in the networks, are people who are media professionals themselves, both in member states and in the Eastern neighborhood, who are interested in, um, what uh, was talked about earlier today in propaganda. We call it the myth-busting uh, part of our work. Uh, the Russian agenda, uh, the Kremlin agenda, has certain myths it relies on. Uh, some of them were already mentioned uh, today by Irina, uh, and we try to describe them to our stakeholders, but also uh, to people who could, uh, in media, be uh, amplifiers of our message, uh, which is, of course, that these uh, myths could and should be challenged. Now, finally, on trolls, a couple of words. I happen to uh, be, have been asked to give a presentation on Thursday on trolls to the member states uh, and uh, to our stakeholders. Uh, so a couple of just my th thoughts after your interesting um, talk about that uh, arena. Um, now, if I say a troll, of course, what is a troll? We use it as a metaphor for these people who um, damage the internet uh, debates but I think we all know that a troll is, of course, something completely different. It's something we were afraid of when we were little children and something our parents told us not to be afraid of. And I always return to that uh, sort of the origin of the metaphor when I advise uh, my hierarchy 
uh, and others in uh, the fear of trolling that we often uh, meet among them. Uh, imagine that you are, say, an ambassador, a spokesperson in an environment which is not exactly friendly. Uh, uh, you wake up every day with the concern that you write or say something that's going to be used against you by the trolls. So the first thing I always tell them as the counselor in trolling is uh, don't forget that it is a troll. And a troll means that you are afraid, you should not be afraid, and they are not there. Uh, and if you keep in mind those three things, uh, they, you can move on and be a little bit more, uh, a little bit less afraid and probably more constructive in your work with them. Trolls are also enemies of enlightenment, I used to say. Now, historically, trolls, of course, take us back to the time when Europe was moving into enlightenment. The trolls and the witches and all these figures sort of uh, were part of a, a sort of a medieval past. Um, when I look at trolls, and I do that every day, I have the feeling that if I were to define their agenda, it is to discredit debate as such. And that's where many of, many of, uh, of in my hierarchy, uh, I think, misunderstand trolls. They think of the trolls as opponents in a debate. They're not. They're actually not opponents. When you've met a real troll, you will remember your opponents positively because they at least respected, if not even you, then the whole situation that you were in. And if you don't respect the situation, then you discredit the debate and you make people say what people in my hierarchy say to me, namely, I don't want a Twitter profile because oh, it's such a dirty place full of all these trolls and, and it looks terrible. And I say to them, no, first you have to disbelieve them. Just think they're not there. That helps you. That's the first thing you do. And the second thing you do is you don't engage in debate because they don't even respect the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the situation. Now, as I said, um, as you also pointed out, Irina, uh, there has been some investigation into trolls. The factory, as it was called, out in Olgen, out of St. Petersburg, was uh, pointed at uh, by investigated journalists. And many people in the West, that was my impression, said, whew, thanks God, finally. It turned out they found the source, it has been discovered, nothing more to worry about. Well, I said, yeah, of course, A, I knew, everyone knew, and B, that doesn't take away the problem. Because the problem of trolling takes us into a general problem in Russian political culture, which is also what you addressed in your intervention arena, namely the lack of credit in debates and in politics and politicians as well. I would go as far as to say that in Russian media, we see trolling happening, not just in debate forums, but in government media, in newspapers, on TV every day. Examples. Last week, we saw two cases of uh, trolling I want to remind you of. One was when uh, a high-ranking Russian, very high-ranking Russian um, decision maker said in an interview that uh, Arseniy Yatsenyuk, who's the prime minister of Ukraine, was actually a Chechen rebel who had fought with the Chechens against uh, uh, the Russian Federal Forces in the first Chechen war between 1994 and 1996. Now, uh, this uh, was said from such a level that you have what you in propaganda call the red herring, uh, the smell that even if you don't believe that Mr. Yersinyuk uh, used to be a Chechen rebel, the smell stays with him for a while and he becomes a persona non grata in any debate in Russia for some while. Later on, the same week, we saw Russian national TV airing last Saturday uh, an entertainment program, I would call it, where Georgia's former president, Mr. Saakashvili, now uh, uh, the governor of the Odessa Oblast in the southwest of, of Ukraine, uh, it was, uh, they had found a um, transvestite prostitute who uh, uh, confessed to having been in a relationship with Mr. Uh, Saakashvili. Uh, of course, these uh, two cases are what we in propaganda theory call big lies. They are uh, simply too crazy. But what they do is that they do exactly what trolls do. They discredit not just the individuals we talk about, but the whole debate. As you pointed out, Irina, they create this feeling that politics and politicians are such a dirty and place that you don't even want to involve yourself. The result of it is that you keep uh, civil society passive. Um, and you avoid debates. Um, on that note, uh, maybe a little bit uh, analytical, I uh, end my intervention here. I hope that you will enjoy reading our uh, 
our action plan and learn more about what we're going to do to to bring, so to speak, the credit back to uh, debates and media in Russian. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I couldn't help but think of another uh, animal that uh, was very popular on social media yesterday around the discussion on pig gate. So sometimes trolls can't really um, control the discussion either and may invite uh, whole different discussions with uh, analogies that um, uh, well are, are an interesting part of a, a, a debate anyway. Before we turn to you, uh, Kaya and I would like to use the opportunity we have as hosts to ask some questions. So Kaya first has a few and then uh, I do and then we'll turn it to you. We have about 40 minutes for discussion left, so. Yes, thank you. So I have uh, one question about uh, surveillance and the other one about propaganda. So um, when you talked about SORM uh, and you talked about, uh, you showed all the examples of, of the uh, ex-Soviet uh, states uh, that have the system, but uh, um, what about those uh, uh, former Soviet Union states that are now currently members of the European Union? So what is the situation there? So do you ha uh, have any information about that? Because uh, if, uh, if a system has been used, it's always, uh, it's there and, and uh, it could be used again. So what, ha what has happened to those, those countries? Uh, and a question about um, and propaganda. I think uh, uh, this is also a very valid point that you made about trolls. And if you think about, uh, uh, you know, Churchill said uh, in the end of the World War II that uh, uh, the truth, uh, the lies across uh, halfway across the uh, world when the truth gets its pants on. So uh, put this uh, this statement in today's information society where everything travels really fast. Uh, so um, and and I absolutely understand that this uh, propaganda. Uh, and trolls are uh, made to discredit the debate and uh, and also make people doubt uh, what is what is actually the truth because it's not so clear that this is the lie and this is the truth but you, it, it makes people doubt and so uh, in long term it just uh, it just discredits the uh, the public uh, sentiment uh, and and so uh, maybe a question what is the weakest element in the chain if we talk about uh, propaganda so it is it comes down to the people who who do these things uh, so who are engaged in the activities uh, on the internet so so maybe you could comment on on those uh, uh, people who do it as well as you have also information how, how that works thank you Thank you. I'll just add my question so you can combine them together. One is a fairly simple one for Andre and Irina, but perhaps also complex. How was the response to your book uh, in Russia? And uh, uh, the offer or the notion that, you know, um, European Endowment uh, for Democracy would be interested in uh, helping distribute the book or, or excerpts of it uh, is is something that we've also seen being very sensitive increasingly in Russia, new NGO laws, uh, European um, or American um, organizations that had worked there being expelled from the country. So perhaps you could say a bit about um, the responses to your book, if there have been any, or, or uh, is it too early to tell? And then um, going, going deeper into the notion of trust, I think that that's really uh, important. Irina said that the discrediting of the West or disappointment with the West after the financial crisis, uh, moreover, was one of the narratives, let's say, that is used in, in propaganda. And to that end, I'm very interested in this broader um, credibility and, and practicing what we preach in Europe question. So um, uh, when you say that there is disappointment in the West and that there has not been, let's say, success uh, of its of its promise. Do you take that also as a sign of uh, a desire to see democracy function well, in a sense? I mean, if you don't believe in it in the first place uh, as an audience, or if you don't have any expectations of it in the first place, it's hard to be disappointed. So can we also see it as an opportunity that there are people and audiences in Russian-speaking areas that would actually like to see the success uh, of democracy is that is that the other is that the flip side of the way in which uh, this narrative is used and perhaps this could also be answered uh, uh, on the other end of the table um, 
because if this credibility and, and the building of trust is so important, it puts even more responsibility on us, uh, not only to make sure that EU-made technologies are not used for, for state surveillance uh, all over the world, but also um, makes it even more essential that democratic principles such as checks and balances and, and democratic oversight, as well as fostering of true freedom of expression, uh, and and um, such democratic principles are, are given more meaning uh, instead of being eroded. I mean, that's my, my personal observation. So um, an opportunity for anyone in the panel to, uh, to respond. Uh, I guess I would like to start with uh, uh, Andre and, and Irina, and then uh, we'll go across uh, the panel, and I'll start to look around for people interested in asking questions. Uh, so first question about uh, uh, European members and... Uh do we have uh, systems similar to SORM? As far as we are identified, and it's extremely difficult to identify these things because it's all uh, untransparent and uh, we just needed to use investigative methods and analyzing open data and uh, not very open data uh, to find these things. But as far as we understand, many countries in, uh, like, well, many countries, well, actually we have this list which, which I presented and that's all. It seems that many other countries decided not to follow the Russian example also because the system was developed and defined in the late 80s, but it, uh, the beginning of uh, impl implementation of the system started in uh, 1992, 1995, and for many countries it, it was too, uh, too costly, uh, it was too, too expensive. Uh, for example, even in Ukraine, yes, we got some some storm systems on the lines, but only now, and the, uh, the, the very recent example happened only yesterday, uh, which is a funny thing that uh, the Crimean operation, uh, operator uh, cannot actually function because Russian authorities asked them to, 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 to buy more equipment for SORM, but because uh, the basic telecommunications uh, equipment was provided by Ericsson, Ericsson refused to supply this, uh, this equipment and uh, actually uh, this uh, Crimean operator is can, can, cannot function. So for many countries, we were very, uh, relatively late in this game. Belarus decided to have a system of SORM only in 2010. So that's why uh, it's, it, it, maybe it was not a question of, uh, of, of legislation, but also uh, the question of cost. So that's why we have uh, this list. And uh, as far as I understand, I think may, maybe Eric might comment on that, but I think this list is, uh, is all that we have. If I'll just comment on that one piece, as I think that's the, the only area I'll be able to contribute, is that some countries have ended up it with systems where they run both ETSI systems, European systems, and SORM systems as well, depending on which part of the network. And so for newer mobile telephony, uh, it's common in most European countries for them to be employing ETSI systems, as they've been recently purchased, and thus with... Etsy systems built in by default, but for the older PSTN systems or your landlined telephone, it's those systems that were used there. But you're right that uh, legacy systems or old ones can be turned and changed in, in peculiar ways. There's a system currently in place in Macedonia that over the last few years has had the unfortunate situation where um, the surveillance systems in place have been used to target political opposition, journalists and others with uh, thousands of individuals um, in having their phone calls intercepted. What's so remarkable about the situation is that many of them have eventually received the intercepts themselves as a result of additional leaks. And so many are now walking around with CD-ROMs of phone conversations they had more than two years ago. Um, this is one of the problems with even lawful interception. Of course, it's predicated on the idea that there's law and that that's followed and that judicial warrants and authorizations are part of that and that there won't be abuse. And this is the difference between a technical system and a system that can technically do something but has the effect and mandate and authority of law. And that's why legal safeguards and strong policy safeguards are, are so crucial and so critical. Uh, the question about the response, I think, first of all, uh, my impression is uh, it's might be too early to, to, to say about the response. So because only two, actually two weeks passed. Um, but at the same time, uh, sometimes Russian forces might be extremely smart in uh, replying to investigations. For example, two years ago when we 
uh, did a big investigation uh, for, for the Guardian about the surveillance systems uh, installed in, in Sochi because of the Olympics, Olympic Games. We expected lots of, the story was published a few months before uh, the Olympic Games, uh, and uh, we expected a lot of things uh, to happen, but instead the Russian authorities have uh, were smart to publish uh, a story with the title, yes, we would listen to your calls, we would spy on you, but it's for all for your security. So actually, they used our investigation to send a message of intimidation to all people who wanted to go to, to the Olympics to, for example, to protest, to do things. So sometimes it's, uh, the scheme might be smarter than we expect. Uh, uh, a few thoughts on propaganda and trolls. Uh, you ask me what is the weakest element of propaganda. Uh, we know strong, strong elements are uh, it's people expectations and emotional messages and uh, Putin's media that is all, uh, all, all that is all is propaganda. Our propaganda is propaganda, but uh, there is uh, the weakest element of Putin's propaganda on the internet. Uh, this is web them itself because uh, the web is decentralized by design and uh, in, the t uh, in, in time of stability uh, you can spread uh, disinformation uh, through the network f uh, very well and it wouldn't be a lot of pushback from the from the users but in the time in, in the times of crisis when people are I, I don't know, in, 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 uh, in times of economical crisis or political crisis, or I don't know when it may be some big natural disaster could happen or, te or another disaster, you, uh, the authorities could not, uh, could not uh, oppose the dissemination of truth uh, through the net because even Putin's uh, belief that the internet uh, ruled by somebody from the CIA in the United States. That's not true. We all know, we, we, we all know that web is, uh, uh, is a net uh, uh, where everybody could participate and everybody could create websites, everybody could post, I its, uh, post his or her information on the social networks. That's the weakest uh, link in Putin's propaganda. Uh, add just one example, which I think is, uh, is really is a very good example of this failure, is uh, the crisis in Ukraine. Because, uh, of course, the Russian authorities were well aware that social networks might pose some problems before the crisis. And Vkontakte is the biggest, largest uh, Russian-speaking uh, social network, was put under control by very harsh methods, and uh, the leadership was replaced. So now we have a situation where the Russian state television is run by uh, by Dobrodiev and Vkontakte is run by his son, so it's, you have his hierarchy. But at the same time, when we got Ukraine and when we got soldiers sent to Ukraine, these soldiers started to post messages identifying themselves in Ukraine. And in this case, the content was generated not by employees of, of, of Kontakte as a company and not under control of this company, but by users. And uh, what you have, uh, Dobrodiev in charge of contact here has nothing to do with this message because uh, he is he's not in, in, in no position to control these things. And I think this fell uh, started in, in the early 2000s when Vladimir Putin actually developed his approach to traditional media. So he thinks, he still thinks, and his people think that they can use the same approach they used against traditional media, specifically TV, now against, uh, against social networks and, uh, and the internet, which, is, uh, which have this... Uh, a fundamental failure uh, that content in, uh, in media generated by employees of this uh, media, but in, on the internet, content is generated by users. Maybe, uh, I will just address very shortly, as I would like to hear as much as possible, Irina and Andre, but just uh, the, the comment on disappointment with the West and disappointment with democracy, as European Endowment for Democracy carry this world with this, its own name. So let me let me answer this uh, in a way that uh, that uh, my Russian friends uh, and people in the region love to deal with any problem, basically making joke out of it. So the joke about this uh, 
quite already known and old, is a very simple, that when the war narrative has reached its peak uh, uh, by Putin, and it was looked like he's going to push tomorrow the red button, the uh, upper middle class in Moscow sent a petition to give him at least one day to take back uh, his kids from their kids from the boarding schools in London, their wives from vacation in Italy and French Riviera, and their mistresses from shopping in Paris. So this is the disappointment about the democracy in the West. So in a sense, we have to basically open space for normal debate that that is exactly where the biggest danger for the propaganda remains. And what uh, Ion was addressing, that trolls are trying to eliminate debate. If we really start to discuss what is our crisis, what is your crisis, then we can come on very good terms together and be friends again. Well, maybe my only comment is that um, we had this problem since the, well, well, I started working as journalist in 1996, and I well remember that then the debate about European values and about democracy was framed by the idea of uh, inevitable economic prosperity. And I think it was very unfortunate and very stupid because actually authoritarian states also might be very prosperous and profitable. People might live very luxurious lives. Uh, and uh, uh, for example, we got, and I think it's a, it, it was a very interesting example when uh, during the Moscow protest in 2011, two people said the same thing about Singapore. They said they are fascinated by Singapore. And the first one was Dmitry Medvedev, the Russian president then. And the second one was Alexei Navalny, who said that he's fascinated by Singaporean experience in fighting corruption. <coughs> so you see that the, the fundamental problem that European uh, values are mostly understood in Russia as a way to prosperity. And if Putin might give us prosperity, so why to care about European values? So maybe we can, we can talk about now about democracy and not about prosperity. These things might be interconnected, but not necessarily. And I think European values are itself are something wrong, uh, uh, worth uh, uh, pursuing. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, Marietta, you brought up the issue of, of uh, Russian laws discrediting Russian legal entities who receive uh, support from abroad. The many of you will have heard about the foreign agents law. Uh, that means that 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 uh, NGOs that receive uh, a sort of a certain critical mass of support from abroad have to declare that and and undergo uh, very very severe audits and and making life technically important difficult for them. Uh, this has many le levels and it brings us back to the the, uh, the the issue of supporting free media in in the Russian speaking part of the world. Um, if you if people uh, uh, subscribe to the uh, fundamental idea that Irina mentioned, namely that the whole world is corrupt and uh, people who are against Putin are just Western agents, uh, th if people subscribe to that idea, then you end up uh, not only with the legislative challenge of becoming a foreign agent, but also of the um, of the uh, uh, other media. Uh, uh, sort of saying that independent media are really the mouthpiece of the West. I'll give a brief example. Last, or two weeks ago, I think it was, Izvestia uh, ran a piece which said, and now hold on, and I'm also uh, mentioning this example because of your uh, Dutch background, uh, said that uh, Nova Gazeta, which has been mentioned a couple of times already, which is a government critical independent newspaper, that it had received a substantial Dutch grant, and that was the reason why they had been over-reporting on the MH17 catastrophe in eastern uh, Ukraine last year when uh, this uh, uh, airplane was shut down. So uh, basically the narrative was that no, uh, in critical media are not critical because they are critical you know, for any other reason, but because they're paid by the West to be critical. Of course that leaves us in a difficult situation because do we want to hand out money to people if they're discredited by our money? No. Uh, but it also, uh, and here in my job as, as advisor, I'm returning to a point I often bring up with my advisees, namely that uh, we should remember that we in the West have this reputation, which uh, was also mentioned, of being the people who think they can just buy themselves out of any problem. We're the rich guys who just say, you know, there's a problem, we'll give them a billion euro and then it'll be fine. That, 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 if that, the, the, there's this piece of truth there is in this is that, that, of course, we need more than just allocating money for people. We need to, to show them support and we need to educate and we need to create awareness and to, to address sort of the general, perhaps sort of even media uh, uh, literacy 
issue in uh, the Russian-speaking population rather than uh, saying that if we paid people you know, Norway Gazette, I think they got 15,000 euro, just one-time support, nothing big, but that discredited them a little bit. That's a very sad situation to find yourself in. No, absolutely, very important point. Uh, maybe some more reporting on the financial crisis would also lead people to understand there's not that much money being invested in, in NGOs abroad or media for that matter. I mean, we've seen systematic budget cuts in international uh, outreach of, of European-based media, so... Uh, perhaps we're paying the price now. Are there any questions after so much information? Oh, many. Great. Okay, I'm going to assemble a few. I'm going to start with these three here and then just go across the room. So, f one, two, three. You first. You. Yeah, with the white shirt. Hello. I'm Eric Dell. I'm from the European Commission. Um, you say that we don't want to engage in debate with the trolls because uh, they don't have the purpose of having a debate. They want to just discredit the debates themselves. However, their ideas may not be confined to the trolls themselves. They easily spread and are relayed. Um, so how then do you deal with the debate with the people who have co-opted the ideas and are still there spreading the ideas, so to speak, as trolls, but no longer uh, now as a private person carrying his own opinion? Yes, my name is Pierre Manuel Thoman, and I do research in geopolitics in University Paris 8, French Institute of Geopolitics and I founded the uh, Eurocontinent internet site. My question about, uh, is about uh, uh, analysis of threats. I think it's a good initiative that at least European Union start to think as a power and to, to build uh, a unit which, if, which thinks in propaganda terms. But from the beginning, to succeed, we should have a right analysis of the threats to Europe. And I'm afraid you missed the targets. The real threats to Europe, this is the Islamic propaganda, Islamization. You know, on social media networks, there are so many messages for Islamic proselytism and, and endangering the future of Europe. Why don't you fight against that first, second? Uh, we, 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 most of the citizens perfectly know that that's the NSA in the United States who is spying Europe using the media uh, networks and uh, social networks to do this regime change policies all around the world. And people are not stupid. They have alternative ways of, in, of uh, access to information inside the West itself. In the United States, for example, itself, which is much, much more criticism to have, uh, their own government than in Europe, so uh, I think, again, we miss the targets. Uh, if the European Union would be a sort of power, sovereign, independent, we should control United States propaganda. And third about the trolls. Thank you. I would like to uh, uh, ask people who have a question, one, to ask a question, and two, we are talking today about Russia. And there's many other important topics. Yes, but you, we'll you miss the point. Time. That's not the real threat. No, but we've heard that that's, that that's your comment, and we appreciate it. But now I would like to go on but to like the Like trolls, you, it's totalitarian. You accuse people of being troll when they got a different opinion of you. But, you know, in France, for example, where I come from, there are many goalist. The goalist uh, approach is to a balanced approach of international relations. And, and people don't believe anymore in this Western propaganda. And uh, I think you have to listen more and more people. They are not trolls. They are people who believe in a different Europe. That's Thank important. You. Maybe somebody can distinguish between trolls and, and, and critics. I think that's a very important question. Yes, go ahead. Yes, hello, everyone. My name is Alexander Gusarov, first secretary of the Mission of Russia to the European Union. Just very briefly, three points. Firstly, I happen to agree with the previous speaker that there is a commonality of threats that Russia and the EU face. And I think we should just stop wasting time with this uh, confrontational rhetoric against each other. Secondly, the debate uh, was, as, uh, was very peculiar in that there was no, no real debate. There's only one uh, a point of view, one narrative present. And the other narrative, which happens to be popular uh, inside the EU as well, is conspicuous by its absence. And third point, um, what uh, concerns Russia and actually other members of the international community most of all, is that this uh, trumped up specter of Russian propaganda is being uh, utilized by some members of the EU and some forces within the EU to renege on the commitments of the EU individually and collectively in the area of uh, freedom of the press, plur plurality of, of the media, and free flow of communication. We have had numerous instances within the uh, previous several years 
where journalists simply on the grounds of their nationality and views were barred from entering certain EU member states, barred from accessing certain EU uh, public events, their uh, licenses were revoked, some have even had unilateral restrictive measures slapped against them. Um, what this amounts to, in fact, is nascent censorship, and it's uh, a bit strange for me that uh, in Alde, uh, in the faction which espouses liberalism and democracy, this issue was only very briefly alluded to by Ms. Schalke at the very beginning. Thank you. A very important point. Uh, none of us, uh, I'm pretty sure, but I can't speak for the others, have, have uh, suggested that banning journalists is a good answer to, uh, you know, to others who may do similar things. So certainly the Alder Group believes in freedom of expression, access to information, multiple voices, uh, multiple media outlets, whether it's online or offline. Uh, and I think that uh, that's the best way for people to make up their own minds, which uh, I hope um, uh, is a, a shared objective among most of us. Uh, because some of these were statements, I'm gonna collect a few more questions because I saw a lot of hands and not that much more time. So we have more to discuss than we can do today. It is not intended to censor any of you. It's just that we have uh, busy agendas. The gentleman in the back, and please be brief, you, yes, with your blue sweater. Yeah, hello, my name is Evgeny, I am a PhD student in engineering here, so I have a bit more technical question. So is this DPI is obligatory for all the like Russian operators, telecommunication operators? Uh, a question to Irina, is this troll factories like Russian invention or is uh, somehow popular across the world and you can identify in different places with this? Thank you. Uh, and one more question, just again, qu uh, technical. So you, Eric, told about three days of stored data. Is it actually happening or it's potential of the system? Because I used to work for a telecommunication operator in Russia and I saw the traffic going to Storm and it's definitely not enough to store any information apart from metadata. So not really, uh, phone calls or web pages or images you actually see. Okay, thank you. Thank you, the lady in the blue jacket. Uh, hi, I'm Kelsey Bjornskut. I studied uh, strategic communication and I was wondering on the propaganda front, in addition to strengthening local media, has anything been done to strengthen grassroots uh, communication movements sort of within Russia? Um, there's been a lot of success in other sort of propaganda for um, countering other forms of propaganda to strengthen grassroots counter narratives to really have um, a voice coming from within the society, especially with the prominence of social media and capitalizing on things like that. Thank you. One more question in this round. Yes, anyone? Jeppe? Jens Jeppesen with the Center for Democracy and Technology. We're a public interest group that focuses on surveillance and free expression on the internet. Like Eric and his colleagues, we uh, try to uh, convince governments that they should roll back surveillance programs and so on and so forth. We mostly work here in the West, Europe and the US. Is there something that groups like ours in the West can do that will help the situation in Russia as you perceive it? That's my question, thank you. I'm gonna go to the left of the table first. Yersi, yeah. can I start with you? Questions, uh, yes. trolls versus critics. Are we making the right threat analysis? How to preserve freedom of expression? Eric can do the DPI uh, <laughs> question uh, and uh, uh, the data retention. And then maybe you two can also talk about grassroots development yeah. and, and yeah. you know what helps. So if I may start with the grassroots because it will be simple and then maybe Jon can move to the trolls. He is the best on it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just about strengthening uh, grassroots uh, media, and that's also uh, my uh, my comment to to colleague. Uh, um, actually, I was I am a former diplomat, so to my colleague from the Russian embassy, is that um, first of all, um, if we talk about equal treatment, uh, we would welcome very much uh, from Russia equal access to your uh, commercial market of media. Try for Western uh, media outlet to get into cable. No way. The administrative measure they will be not allowed. Dost was eliminated from uh, cable access to cable. So, yes, and they are only based now on the subscription to internet. 
So in a sense, um, let's be serious when we really open debate between uh, Europe and Russia to talk about equal treatment. We are not equally treated. And you are implementing so many regulations and law that prevents actually plurality of media on your market. And you're complaining that you do not have enough plurality on the Western market with your presence of Sputnik and Russia today. So uh, this is uh, uh, exactly about uh, the limitation of strengthening local uh, and grassroots media. Uh, if we try to really uh, 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 do this and work uh, between different NGOs and establishing different contexts uh, across the borders in Europe, then of course we are facing those dramatic uh, uh, legal limitations. No one, even a local media that has nothing to do with politics in Russia, doesn't want to be called for an agent. Inostranny agent nikomu nie chodzi co stać. So this is something that limits those cooperations and that limits this uh, natural uh, uh, trend between like-minded people to just work together for the better world. Yes, thank you. Also, I'm not a former diplomat, I am a diplomat. So I will allow myself to, to also address uh, initially, uh, as the first thing, my colleague's uh, intervention. I think it's very highly relevant what you said about uh, sort of the specters that are being uh, created. And I think that we as diplomats and as advisors have a, a share and obligation to inf sort of inform our hierarchy. Uh, for example, uh, I, I, as I also hinted at in my intervention, uh, spent uh, every day in my uh, line of work uh, trying to, to make it clear to my hierarchy that, that the, um, sort of the, the, the opinion that is critical towards the West in Russia is not a result of a Russian conspiracy uh, paid for by the Russian government. And sort of the Olgina should explain everything. It's sometimes I hope I can feel in Western opinion uh, that as if we have discovered that these people were just paid to be skeptical towards the West policies in Ukraine and elsewhere, then, then, then that explains everything. No, of course, there is, uh, as we have been talking about also, uh, a skepticism towards the West that is historically founded in Russia uh, and which, which is a premise uh, uh, in, in which we are working and, and in which our hierarchy should know about. I, I cert certainly uh, also hope that similarly my, my Russian colleagues will, will keep their uh, in hierarchy informed about uh, sort of uh, the limitations of the conspiracy in the West against Russia, uh, specifically the, the sort of the American-controlled uh, 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 conspiracy against Russia, that there are uh, friends of Russia uh, and Russian culture and Russian language uh, even as deep into the EU as in the European External Action Service. Thank you. Well, Andre um, can speak more authoritatively on what the requirements are on Russia, but it's mine. Uh, about DPI because it's a very technical thing. So in 2014, uh, the Ministry of Communications of Russia issued new requirements uh, which were then cited on uh, by the minister, which requires not only uh, the access to data on the level of applications, which means DPI actually, the seventh level uh, was mentioned specifically, but also the web, uh, e uh, the, the web services like Gmail and Yahoo were specifically mentioned it in the in the text of its new requirements and these requirements are uh, requested all russian internet service providers to install new versions of sorm combined with dpi by the first april of the of uh, this year and just to uh, answer the question about the the likely use of sorm in various different telecommunications companies it's my understanding that of course these systems vary depending on the operational goals of um, the different agencies, and certainly what we've seen in terms of equipment being exported, there's lots of old systems continue to be maintained, new ones being installed in different ways. So I imagine it's quite likely that lots of the systems are still capturing a very a, a limited amount of information. Um, what we've also seen is that that doesn't exclude the possibility that on that same network, a larger amount of uh, communications are being processed elsewhere. And there was a question about uh, about uh, whether trolls are Russian invasion, uh, are, are Russian in invention. Uh, you know that many countries use propaganda, and many states use propaganda on on the social network. Uh, for example, uh, Israel has in inside its defense ministry a special regiment. Uh, uh, tasked to spread propaganda uh, on the social network or in all some information on the social network, say so. And the United States are quite successful uh, disseminating uh, uh, propag uh, propaganda on the social network and even using their strategic communication structures. Uh, but, um, and the 
troll is an old school internet term, you know, but uh, uh, such a, a phenomenon as troll uh, trolls uh, factory is a Russian invention. Uh, so far, it wasn't uh, there wasn't detected any trolls farms in uh, in other countries. Maybe this uh, experience would be disseminated around the world. I don't know. I, I don't want. I don't want it would be disseminated. So that's a qu answer. Thank you. Three more very quick questions and then 30 seconds for everyone on the panel. I'm going to this side of the room, uh, the lady in the back, and then the gentleman here, and one of you two <laughs> in the front. You can Please. figure it out in the meantime. Yes. Please, the lady with the pink, uh, white shirt. So thank you. I can't tell where you're from, and maybe that's a good thing. So, please, the lady in the back. Thank you, thank you very much. So, I have mm, a question to Mr. King. That you said that you can't really draft the security laws. Do you have some uh, cyber security laws included in this? Uh, second, se uh, uh, second question is very interesting. Here is n nobody speak about this. It's a very strong Russia propaganda in the uh, Russian minority in EU countries. I mean, uh, Estonia, Letonia, Moldova is not the EU country, but is near EU. Um, so, what? Uh, uh, why do you? Uh, what other countries are doing against this? Uh, or it's a special countries, and uh, why the EU institution uh, does nothing <coughs> against this? Uh, I mean, you can have a, a data exchange, for example, in this situation. Uh, why they are doing this? What is the 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 the, uh, the mission of this propaganda? So uh, it's very interesting. This. Thank you, so. sir. Uh, Ian McWilliam from Free Press Unlimited in Amsterdam. Um, Andre and Irina, could you say something about the effects of all this surveillance on independent journalists and independent media in Russia? Uh, are they ignoring the dangers? Uh, are there some ways around it? Or are they self-censoring? Because there are still some remaining independent media. Thank you also for being brief in the front. And then one of you two can ask a question too. Yes, quickly, please. Thank you, Thomas Lieder, independent journalist from Czech Republic. I would like to ask uh, two questions. Uh, first on propaganda, whether you could elaborate a little bit on the differences between Russian propaganda aimed abroad and uh, inside Russia regarding the means, the institutions that are involved. That's the first one. And second on the surveillance and internet censorship, whether do you see any differences between Chinese and Russian approach to this uh, topic? Thank you. Excellent. My name is Rostislav Demchuk. I uh, represent uh, Ukrainian agency for Euro Atlantic Cooperation. My question is um, uh, lying in uh, uh, this uh, uh, format. Um, it's Russian propaganda, and uh, uh, Russian propaganda and impact of Russian propaganda of Western medias. So, as you know, probably such uh, uh, your colleagues like uh, Tatiana Zhdanok, who uh, very often quotes uh, Russian media here and spreads uh, such uh, uh, sources like um, Live News, which is uh, already um, uh, known as a um, propaganda machine of Russia, or another is. Uh, um, uh, Russia I'm Today is another uh, I'm propaganda really sorry. machine yeah. who are trying to spread their. Uh, so we are, we are. I think uh, the question is clear. We are monitoring uh, the every uh, morning, every day, the, uh, the articles about Ukraine. What's going about Ukraine? So now we find out. No, I think we have to cut it off because we have one more minute so and people I'm are I'm outside I'm there and then we will not I'm have a chance I'm for the panel. What is the impact of Russian propaganda on Western media? Do I understand yeah, that yeah, correctly? Yeah. Thank you. And how it's possible to, 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 uh, to, 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 to struggle uh, against this? Thank you. Okay, great. Um, let me go to Eric first, then to Jersey, uh, then to Kaya on the uh, uh, Estonian question, and then... Uh, John, do you want to uh, let me know if you want to come in and ask end with our two uh, guests of honor? Yes. Um, very briefly, the question was: uh, While there are surveillance laws being passed in many member states, are there equal cybersecurity laws? And the answer is not to my knowledge. Uh, I think this is a shame. Uh, in fact, in many of the surveillance laws that are being passed, there will be measures um, that will 
uh, damage cybersecurity as we undertake something called computer network exploitation, otherwise known as hacking. Uh, this would be very harmful to our cybersecurity and I think needs additional scrutiny. Uh, my 30 seconds just to make a clear distinction between two very important issues that often in such a debate are mixed. Uh, first, uh, Russian language media space, and it is not a propaganda really that goes through this, it's, a, it's a engineering, social engineering, and the Russian propaganda that is through uh, the languages of the nations that are either free or not free, but outside of Russian language media space. So uh, I think especially in the West, uh, in, the, in, in our world, we can easily manage to, to, to have an open debate with any kind of uh, um, steer from, from Moscow media that are in our languages because our media space is free and here we have enough tools to really address this. So the struggle is there, but we can do it. In case of Russian language media space, this is what we are calling, it's not counter propaganda, it's bringing back many voices, plurality, the base of the modern society. Let's have many voices and let's have real debate and let's talk. So this is what really needs to be brought back, plurality, balance and quality journalism to Russian language media space, not counter propaganda. Very briefly, because I don't have time to go into details, but uh, uh, I think uh, different EU states are, are at uh, doing differently, but, uh, but this is what we have done is uh, we have opened this Russian TV channel, but the problem is the uptake by the, uh, by the consumers or, or the citizens, because if they don't just don't watch it, then you, you can't really, really give the information. And, and of course, the Russian channels have so many, you know, stars for the Russian people and, and all the uh, means to do uh, proper programs, what we don't have. Uh, very shortly about one uh, very interesting question about China and Russia. Uh, these systems are completely different. Uh, in China, it's a more technological approach. That's why thousands of people are involved in this work, and it's technologically it's very advanced. In Russia, the system is based on intimidation, on sending a message. So that's why in Roskomnadzor, Russian body, which is um, in charge of uh, censoring the internet, there are actually about 10 people involved in un in deciding what should be censored. So it's. Uh, it's, it's the idea is to intimidate people not to post something on the internet, not to actually to identify everybody who tried to do something. It's to, about sending a message. Just for that, uh, to, um, to, to oppose any kind of propaganda, you need to have a very, a very professional and independent media, and you need to develop uh, quality journalism, such as not a question of the moment, such as a question of democracy and prosperity for the society. Thank you. That's a very good point to end on, although there's lots more to discuss, but independent media and uh, uh, freedom of expression is probably the best remedy against any myths, confusions, or propaganda. Thank you for your time, and I uh, hope to see you again soon. out of reality. It's not going to even work, the unit, because member states don't agree at all with the goal of these stupid units. What if there are only uh, Baltic people and uh, British who are anti-Russian? You know? It's not going to work. Member states are divided in this. They're stupid. Non, j'ai fait mon doctorat. Ah oui. Ou au Parlement Oui, parce qu'ils ne veulent pas parler de... Comment elle a essayé de détourner ma question. Oui, on parle que de la Russie.